Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Justin. Yes, there's so much to dive into with LSX, your company. For people who don't know, though, what are you doing with LSX? <laughs> so basically, what we're trying to do is build a better way for companies to, I mean, get direct access to media and creators to pretty much build their brands organically, right? So we're essentially building the infrastructure layer in the background for how companies seamlessly connect with creators who are already looking for content to write about or people to interview with, and also community builders who are looking for guests to come on their, to share with their communities. Um, and we're doing it because right now it's really hard for companies to get out there and get the word going, get word of mouth going, because there's so much noise out there in the market right now. And we believe that the best way for companies to um, reach their audience is by sharing their stories and their insights in a more authentic fashion. Um, and also for creators, um, we're actually making it a lot easier for them to find interesting companies to cover and get a lot of content for their audience. Yeah, there is an endless amount of content and ideas and people to connect with that like you never would find before. And I love the idea that you guys are doing something to connect people because I'm always looking for guests, of course. And even on the brand side with Vitalize, the venture firm we're at, like we're always looking for ways to get on podcasts and get you know written about as well. So any brand trying to grow, I can see the value from this. How did this start though, Richard? I'm curious. Yeah. Um, so before I even started this, was whole like this is my fourth startup. So I have whole like startup journey before that. <laughs> um, so I'm originally from Ghana. Um, so I got into college um, at 17, and I got my first laptop when I got to college in Ghana. Um, I was excited about building, right? So I got my first laptop finally. I was like, I get to build cool stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, I mean, put it together. I learned C plus plus. I learned C. Then I had an Android app that I built like a year later after getting the laptop. And I had a bunch of my classmates that were excited about using it. So what we did was um, we incorporated Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter into one app. So these apps used to be like around 100 megabytes cumulatively back in 2013, 2014. They were quite big um, for mobile devices back then because they didn't have a lot of memory. And what we did was we, we created them on a web view and reduced the size to 1.7 megabytes. And a bunch of my classmates in Ghana were excited. We're using it on campus. And... Um, I mean, we're just talking about it. So we just had people talk about it and people are using it. My, my dad even downloaded the app. I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but then, yeah, so one of the main pain points at that point was, um, even though we do something that we knew people wanted, um, we were students back then. Um, I was pretty much um, making like around like a hundred bucks in pocket money per month. So I couldn't spend on ads and I didn't have anyone influential in my network. So it was like really, really hard to get good going, even though we knew we had an initial spark with the product. Um, so yeah, so that was that one. Then I did another startup after that in the ad tech space. So think of it like Pokemon Go, but instead of looking for Pokemon, you're looking for ads in the real world. So like you could be on Central Park and go like grab five Nike ads and come back to Nike and be like, okay, I copped five of your ads. So I get like a free, like special edition shoe or something. And so a more interactive way of for brands to actually get in front of their audiences, not just like passively engage with what they're already doing on Twitter or on Instagram or YouTube, but like actively become part of their, life, their lives. Um, but yeah, so that one too was good, but it was way too early for its time. Magically, it didn't really work out. Google Glass didn't work yeah. out. So all the platforms that AI <laughs> could have pretty much worked out on didn't really work out. Um, so yeah, I just moved on and I... Uh, so I graduated in computer science, summa cum laude. Then I uh, did a bunch of consulting projects and got a couple of awards from GE too. And I came to the U.S. Um, to do a master's in business. Uh, but before then, my, that's why I met my co-founder, Leah, right? So she has a really strong background in marketing. She was the first marketing I had to Boston Tech Startups herself. Um, she also came in to the U.S. from Bulgaria with just 300 bucks, and she pretty much worked her way through college. And one of the biggest pain points um, for her, like as a first marketing hire for startups in Boston too was getting the founders that she was working with like more I mean brand awareness and get more people to hear about them because it's really hard for them to um, break through the noise ultimately and so what she did to help them out was she built her own like um, blog so she wrote a blog about startups innovation where she got to 10,000 unique visits a month but the main pain point for her too at that point was uh literally which kind of companies that she can she cover and all the people that were coming to her inbound were not high quality and she also wanted to find um people that were also had diverse voices and diverse takes on different topics it was really hard to um find interesting stories on a consistent basis so as a creator that's one of the main pain points creators have and as a brand we also know what brands have is like um, we need to build a better way for um, companies and brands to work together um, in a way that is not just based on um 
who you know, who's already in your network or something like that. But it's pretty much based on what you're working on and what you like to write about or talk about, literally. That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> what, what, what a journey to get to this point then. So obviously you find your co-founder, which is a, bi a big part of it, you know, finding a co-founder for the company, which a lot of mm -hmm. people go through that and find different ways of going about it. But that gets you to this point, obviously, of starting LSX then. What was the kind of early stage in terms of, you know, customer discovery, figuring out what the product would be initially? Take me through some of that stuff too. Yeah, it's been very different. So initially we thought it was going to be like a search engine for, for journalists. That was the beginning part. <laughs> but um, along the line, um, it changed a lot, right? So now we're, what we are is more like an earned media marketplace, but the bigger vision is actually to become um, the engine for content for how people find and discover organic content to write about or to get in front of the audience or like to share. Um, but it, it's been quite a journey. So we started off with a small product, um, built it out in a month after like when we incorporating, had our first paying um, beta user like a month after building the beta. Um, we've always had I mean, paying beta users, just saying. <laughs> um, so that's <laughs> yeah, that, that's really good to know. But yeah, but yeah, so basically we built that out. And then the thing that we saw was once we built that, that was really hard um, for that, that part of initial product to work because a lot of people on the creator front or writer front didn't necessarily know who they were looking for. They were typically looking for someone, but usually they'll just go with the most famous person because that's um, who they could find online. Um, but I mean, they also, when it came to our platform to search, they weren't really searching that much. So we had to, I mean, rethink the idea again. So what we built then was that we started creating something for event organizers to just find guests for their, their conferences. And that began to pick up a lot, right? So we had, uh, we have HubSpot, we have um, Startup Grind, a couple of hotshot um, event people use our platform to find speakers for some of the events that they host. And it was going well, we even at Harvard use it. And we got to a point where, um, was picking up and COVID hit. So pretty much all the online events, like you know, all the in-person events just went to zero. So I remember that moment, I just called my co-founder. I'm like, you know what? You know, this cool thing we're having with this event, like in person and people using that platform. Well, this is going down. So we might as well think of a new way. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and that was an interesting conversation. So right after that, um, uh, we had to now focus on creators and see how, um, like startups could leverage creators. And that's where we had our first few podcasters come on board after speaking to a number of them. So we, how we built it was we spoke to a number of podcasters and writers to see, okay, what do they look for in a guest? Um, what is their main pain point? Um, like pretty much understanding what kind of people they want to have on the show and how they find them now in the moment and what variables they look out for. And based on that, we built the initial MVP for that. And we had a bunch of podcasters join the MVP once we launched it out on Product Hunt. Um, I mean, just so you know, we have like a huge waiting list right now of like, like 370 companies. That's amazing. Want to join? Yeah, but that was it. Then, then eventually we figured out. We started seeing a lot of um, writers trickle in. So we have a writers from TechCrunch, Business Insider, and um, larger publications who also saw this as huge value add to what they are working on. Because sometimes they need to find interesting um, people to chime in on different topics they're writing about. So um, that is why they come to our platform for that. One of the things, yeah, I'm also on that waiting list. I just joined, by the way. So <laughs> fingers cr fingers crossed I can convince Richard to give me up higher. But one of the things I want to go back to is the, the product hunt launch. How did that come yeah. about and how did it, that, that end up going for you? Uh, so what's good? Um, so basically, it's pretty straightforward. We, I mean, we had KP. I don't even know KP from, from on deck. Um, but basically, he launched. Yeah. People know him from Twitter. Yeah, yeah he's the yeah. Yeah, he's <laughs> a public guy for sure. <laughs> yeah, he's a cool buddy of us. Um, so basically, um, yeah, we set everything up. We um, put it out the product on like the product on product hunt, and we had a lot of people just for some reason just come to us. So so far, we spent zero dollars on marketing, just so you know. And um, a lot of people came in there, and we also have a lot of word of mouth and good comments from a few of our beta users previously, and it just helped push the app. I think we came up to the fourth product of the day on that day and it was like i think one of the top 10 in the week which was really good excited about i'm hoping to beat that next time we do a product <laughs> what kind of <laughs> numbers did you see from that just curious what, what kind of numbers in terms of subscriptions like, or yeah like, or yeah um, what happened um, impact of it so, oh it was a lot so we had i mean in that two three days of that first week of product hunt, we had like around 200 companies join the wait list um and we had people just join the platform. We at that, at that time we were testing still, so we let a few people in to just 
um, I trained a few more on the business model and everything. And yeah, we got a lot of them um, who loved it. And we have a lot more of them still waiting to join. And yeah, we'll, we'll get him in. We'll get him in. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. I actually just talked to yeah. uh, someone from a company called Last Crumb, the CEO of that company. And they have yeah. like, yeah, a massive waiting list. It's a consumer company, so it's a little bit different. But massive yeah. waiting list right now, you know, trying to match supply and demand is always really interesting. Uh, and especially like this type of thing too. Like you can't just take everyone instantly. It's like, you yeah. find company. So it's tricky. And one of the things you mentioned too is the business model. What is the kind of the current business model? How'd you land on on that today for, for LSX? Yeah, so initial the initial business model was supposed to be in our mind was um, like a paper connection. So basically once we connected you to a writer, podcaster, we just charge like a flat fee irrespective of who it is or what they're writing about. Um, but fast, I mean, quickly we saw that it wasn't really ideal for our use case because our goal is not just to make the connections happen, but actually kind of create a new way for companies to um, reach their audiences via media and creators. So we're pioneering something we call authentic marketing. So to do that, we need a lot more people in the company, not just like a marketing team using the platform. We need a CEO, CFO, CRO, pretty much anyone who is a function in the company. They have interesting insights based on what they're working on. And we believe that they should go out there and share with interesting audiences that are tailored to what they do in the company. So for example, you could have a, I mean, like a blockchain startup with, um, I don't know if they have CEOs now, but basically, <laughs> <laughs> touché, touché. But, <laughs> but, but basically it's a CTO of a blockchain startup who wants to um, like pretty much help build the grand brand. Um, they get access to a lot of technical podcasts or technical writings or technical community events that they can actually go in front of and talk about what, how the company is doing things different from, from other companies out there in the blockchain space or what the insights have found, like, are and what they found out so far. And we believe that this should cut across from not just the CTO, but I mean, marketing person could do that for what's happening in marketing. Um, I mean, product person could do what's happening in product and um, cheap revenue and finance to talk about revenue and finance but basically we believe that building the company uh, organically is not just a function of a marketing team it's more organic interactions from every team member with um, different audiences to be able to help people hear about what the company is doing and what their mission is and what their insights and their values are um, and on the creative front i mean what we're seeing there is we're seeing all these people who are I mean, creating their own content and they're trying to write about interesting startups. But the main pain point for them is um, most of these creators are pretty much limited to who they can invite or interview by their networks. And we believe that we have to unlock the whole entire creator economy so a lot more people can partake in that. So, for example, if you like to interview cool people, we want to be the platform you come to so you can keep interviewing cool people irrespective of whether you're in India or you're in South Africa or somewhere because, again, you're a good storyteller, you're a good person to, like who's good at interviewing. So we should give you the people you need to interview and you just focus on giving your audience the best um, sort of content they want and just keep making them happy. And that way you get to grow your audience and, um, I mean, startups will get a distribution they need. Yeah. How did you think about just in terms of the pricing, like who 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 you were going to charge on the on that front in terms of the business model, and then landing at that, you know, currently ninety nine could change as people listen mm -hmm. to this, you know, years from now. But how did you land on the pricing, and then who you're going to actually charge on which side of that? Yeah, yeah. So we we ultimately now at a subscription model for startups. Um, basically, we're seeing a lot of SaaS tools we have to build to make the whole um, pretty much entire um, space more efficient. So we're going to use the SaaS pricing model. Um, how did we land at 99 or just testing a number of things, right? So we, I think we started at 59, then we went to 87, then we came to 99. But funny enough, we actually have companies that are later stage like, like hitting on our door. So we had <laughs> series B, series A companies willing to come in. We had a company that went public this earlier this year who wanted to use our platform. And these guys are looking to pay anywhere between like um, 10 to 15K a month for exactly what we're building. And when it comes to all the features we want to put together in the future so it's like uh we're, we know we're underpricing based on what we're doing but it's still like something we need to do to give access to people who may not have um, a lot of money to pay because one of our missions is not just to um pretty much make the connections happen but our mission statement says that we want to empower relationships or foster relationships that empower innovators to succeed so i'm thinking about the innovator somewhere in bangladesh or India or somewhere in Asia who has just a really, really good idea, but it has don't, doesn't have an easy way of getting the word out about what they're working on. And basically, we want to be able to empower such a person. And we also want to empower companies that have like thousands of employees too, and that are trying to like go to the next level with their companies too. So yeah, thinking of all those people and trying to make sure that um, we create something that is going to be beneficial to everybody and help everyone succeed.
Yeah. And the, the testing part, part of that, I mean, there's always so many ways to go about that with, with pricing and having talked to just like hundreds of entrepreneurs now, <laughs> everyone has a different approach for that. And you, yeah. know, you have to just try something out. And a lot of times they're under pricing, but to your point, yeah. it like, depends on your mission is who you're trying to get access to and how you, you know, approach it moving forward with, with you then for, you mentioned word of mouth being a, a big driver and obviously I'm sure you had a massive bump with, with product hunt as you kind of talked about, but what today is kind of feeling the growth or how do you look at growth for LSX now in terms of how you get to that next, next stage? Yeah. Um, I mean, word of mouth is one of the big ones. Um, we have partnerships with a few startup service providers and startup um, accelerators. So we're actually partnered with OnDeck. Um, we have a perk with Techstars. We have a number of things with, I mean, Bombilo, um, Lunch House. So we have all those relationships already in place. So basically on our door, when it comes to startups, you're already just knocking um, pretty much <laughs> because you have a lot of leads coming in through there. So there's the partnerships, there's the, there's the word of mouth that is also bringing in a bunch of people from referrals. And also one of the other thing is content. So Leah and I, and my, I mean, Leah and my co-founder, that is, so we do a lot of content. Leah writes for um, Built-In. She does a lot of podcasts. We use Twitter a lot. Um, I write for Entrepreneur Magazine. I use Twitter a lot. I do a lot of podcasts. Um, pretty much anything to go out there and reach the people that um, we cannot reach otherwise by our manual efforts or through content. So we want to actually build a relationship with these people, not just um, shoot out a bunch of ads at this point. So basically we want to um, skill our organic reach in the content we're putting out there. Yeah. How did you land on that like that strategy as the the way to go? I know there's other people, one person that comes to mind is uh, Ruben Harris from Career Karma. Mm -hmm. Had him on the show previously and you know they invest heavily in content and they are getting like a, I don't know, a million uniques a month mm -hmm. or something crazy. Like how did you land that strategy for you guys in terms of using that? Yeah, I think honestly with with content, I think content is actually going to be the main, I mean, driver of growth for most companies in the next five to ten years. Um, because um, I mean, now product is super easy to build, right? Um, you could use no-code tools. You could use, um, I mean, engineering talent is like, I mean, for some people it's scarce, but it's actually, if you look on a global scale, there's a lot of them everywhere. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm from Ghana, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, basically, um, so what is going to help companies stand out is the ability to, I mean, keep the attention of the I mean, target audience or target customers. And... Um, content is one way to do that. You educate your customers through, I mean, podcast or through having like um, articles out there, through even having like your own TV show. I think Wistia has something like that. I think yeah. HubSpot, HubSpot actually has, um, I mean, a lot of content they put out there in podcasts and they have a whole media network really, pretty much running HubSpot and literally all their leads come from their blogs and articles and their content and they have never, that's the, that's the most literally. Like even you can build the best software that, outcompete HubSpot, right? but you don't have that mode of HubSpot's content. That's what's going to keep getting them to like win. And most startups don't really get the fact that it's not just about the product or the tech. It's more about what other um, content pieces do you have out there? What other modes can you build that are not related to your product that can bring people in? So there's content, there's community, which is something we were looking at. Um, so, I mean, we used to have community events where we bring our I mean, founders and people who are um, in the beta together to just talk about different startup related topics. Um, for example, we had a couple of um, VCs come to talk to them, and um, <laughs> last year Christmas we had a music person play music for them. So we were playing. <laughs> it was virtual though. It was virtual music concert, um, Christmas carols kind of thing. So any way to engage the the community um, is another thing to do. Um, but basically, it's we, we're seeing more that we, we picked that approach because we actually want to build a long term relationship. We're actually thinking of a company from the next like ten to fifteen years, like a very long horizon, and we believe that the best mode to build now will be the content mode because once we have it we can literally like do anything when it comes to the product but it's the content and the backlinks and all the people's um, goodwill that is going to keep us going T tell me more about how that plays into you know talking to investors potentially with that strategy and obviously you know as being at a vc firm like we expect certain growth and everything <laughs> but how does that play to that or those conversations or what are you hearing around around that side of things too yeah um so far, we haven't had any pushback per se on that strategy because um, I think the investors we're talking to are more long-term focused and we have a number of hotshot um, angel investors already on board and who are actually supporting us in any way we I mean, we need them to. But I think we that is not really a big play whatsoever. Um, basically, we're partnering. We have a cap table thesis we're looking out for um, particularly. So it's pretty much people who have a longer-term horizon than the ones we're talking to or the ones we already have on board. 
So yeah, um, but I think eventually, once we get to a point, we might um, activate a few um, growth, I mean, faster growth mechanisms. But as it stands now, content is going to be the moat. And actually, that is the moat that is going to last longer than just shooting at a bunch of ads or like a random spend on anything that is going to give us quick, quick returns in the moment. Yeah. And definitely goes back to the, you know, the idea of making sure you have investors who are aligned and who understand yeah. that and what the strategy is and finding those people that get what you're what you're doing, which is obviously why they're investing. But um, one of the things I'm curious about, you mentioned was Launch House. How yeah. was Launch House? How'd you get into that? How was the experience? <laughs> So basically, we got into Launch House. We got invited by one of the founders. We were actually trying to do like a partnership with them. Um, and we're like, okay, you know what? You guys seem like you're working on something really cool. Why don't you do a Launch House? They're like, you know what? We should do that too. <laughs> so my, my co-founder, Leia, is actually in OnDeck. So she actually been to OnDeck and the whole startup community. I'm like, okay, that's cool. I'm like, okay, so let me try out Launch House for a month and see how it goes. And I really loved it. I think the community is amazing. Um, it's pretty much about who you meet and the community. So far, I've met a couple of really smart young people um, in Lunch House who are working on interesting problems. And I, I believe that, um, I mean, that is probably going to scale to a bigger community because there's something special about having like IRL meetups, like in a place than just like online communities. And that's what Lunch yeah. House brings to the table. Yeah, that's something that we're actually thinking about a lot with uh, Vitalize Angels, our angel investing community. It's like, mm -hmm. we have all these people around the world, <laughs> like 300 yeah. members or whatever. <laughs> How do we do events like in person at different locations? Because we know we want to connect them. And like, even in LA where I am, we have a bunch of people from LA, a bunch of SF in Chicago where we're located. And even today on a call, I had someone who was in uh, Berlin and then someone else is in like London and Europe wondering about like, can we do meetups in, in Europe with uh, Vitalize Angels members? And it's like, yeah, that'd be amazing to do. And that builds that community and that moat for moving forward where it's like, why would you join LSX? Well, they also have this massive community <laughs> of people. It's like, it makes a lot of sense with that. With you guys too, what is the experience like for someone using LSX? Tell me, you know, right now at least, what does that look like from, you know, click join, whatever it may be, or apply, <laughs> obviously to get accepted, but what does that look like in terms of that experience? So that's once you're already in or once you're waiting to join in. <laughs> yeah, in the early, early stage before you even get in. And then once you get in. Oh, it's quick. Um, so basically, um, our wait list to be able to actually get accepted once we open it up is you need to have a product in the market. You need to be full time on your business. You need to have raised some funding or have some revenue. Um, we're doing this just to make sure there's some level of quality on the platform when it comes to startups. We don't want just like, we don't want someone who just woke up a day or two ago and just, came up with an idea in this garage to just jump on LSX. No, we're not like an ad platform. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so no, we're not that. Um, so that's what we're, we do for startups to make sure they're high quality. Um, but pretty much um, the goal ultimately is to make it a lot easier for um, interesting, I mean, people or startup members to find um, opportunities to go out and spread the word about what you're working on. So, I mean, what we have now is more like an earned media marketplace. So you see a lot of um, opportunities to go on podcasts, newsletters, talk about what you're working on. Sometimes you see a couple of events pop in there and just send a request. Like, all you have to do is literally click a button. Um, so there's no pitching. There's no like pretty much trying to sell yourself because basically we're selling you once you're on our platform, you're pretty good enough to be on a platform. And um, in the future, the goal is to literally um, use, tap into a lot of ML and um, analytics, actually. So basically, once we, what we're seeing is once um, someone goes on a podcast or once um, someone gets written about a newsletter or something like that or like an event, it's really hard for them to measure the value of that, right? And it's hard for them to see how they can keep doing it and how they can optimize the efforts around all those things. So that's something we'll actually be doing, um, actually helping people understand how all these things come together organically. So, for example, imagine you um, and everyone at Vitalize is going out there speaking on Vitalize behalf on different um i mean platforms on podcasts youtube whatever it is yeah. if there's a way to pull out our data together and help you understand that that's actually going to be um we believe that's going to be very valuable right now and a lot of people are more likely to use that as a the primary medium of reaching their audience instead of going with um like a bit superficial methods like ads right now because ads the reason why a bunch of people spend on ads is because of the fact that they can actually measure it and optimize it it's, they have a sense of control so we figured give people a sense of control when it comes to going out there and building the brand and talking about what they're working on. Um, we believe that a lot of people are more likely to um, 
want to actually go speak to people instead of just sitting behind the PC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like people, people intuitively know that it's going to be useful, but yeah. it's hard to, hard to track those things. And I know we're uh, almost out of time here. So what is the best yeah. way for people to get in touch with you and also to learn more about LSX? Yeah. Um, they can follow the company at LSX Inc. on Twitter. Um, they can connect with me on Twitter at Richard, R-I-O-M-E-N-S-A-H, Rio Mensa on Twitter. And they can also follow the company on LinkedIn, um, LSX um, on LinkedIn. So pretty straightforward right there. Just, or just Google LSX and you find a lot of links. You can just get them. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Richard, this was a lot of fun. We could uh, could have dove into way more. Maybe have to, uh, yeah. a part two, a round two sometime. But thank you so much for coming Definitely. on the show. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Yeah.